got to pay some bills and pay some debts. I got to talk to the tax folks and see if we can run that number down because I believe I paid out over a hundred grand last year between a couple different countries. Now they're trying to hit me again at the end of the year. It's almost like I don't even fight for minimum wage sometimes. Look, I ain't trying to be one of these guys asking for more money. I'm not. I'm asking for the government to stop taking so much of this. Maybe we put something in the contract that's like when platinum gets paid, the taxes get paid. That's my money. Don't give me money if you don't want me to spend it. Then you're going to come back and ask me for some later? That don't make no sense. I'm trying to wild out, bro. I need my ties on the beach. And with that, welcome to Early Stop, which is show where the news of the day is usually given just enough time, but sometimes not enough. If this is your first time stopping by, we thank you and get ready for something you won't find anywhere else. I'm John Franklin. I am joined shortly, presently, and as always by the great Craig Allen of Fight Night Picks. Craig, how are you? I'm well, John. I love your shirt. I don't know where you got it. I love it. I'm sporting a Joe Carter BP jersey. Touch them all, Joe. You'll never hit a bigger home run in your life. Going back to 93. Um, had a great Canada day. Got a, got a round of golf in. Won the little tournament we were having. And it's the first round I've had all year. So, yeah, overall, having a pretty good day. Um, no fireworks, no gatherings of any kind. So that's kind of a bummer. But apart from that, pretty good Canada day. I had an okay Canada day. I started out uh, slow, wasn't feeling the greatest, but I'm on the upswing, so so we're good. All right, Craig, on this episode of Early Stoppage, we talk divisions on life support, Fight Island, and Husky Gus. But we begin at 185 pounds. Joe Rogan did his best Adam Schefter impression and dropped some news on his podcast. Still, have a, still hasn't given his thoughts on Chris D'Elia, but that's another story. But he did tell us that Israel Adesanya and Paulo Costa will be coaching the next season of The Ultimate Fighter. Now, Costa made mention of this on Twitter, and really all we have heard from the Adesanya camp is Eugene Berriman saying he doesn't know anything about it. There's a lot to unpack here, and I'm sure we'll unpack it all. But my first question, Craig, is does Tough need Adesanya and Costa to boost ratings, or do they need Tough to promote their fight? Who needs who more? Huh, there, there is a lot to unpack. I mean, you look into it, and... Do we really want another season of tough? The last season that we had was what? Heavy hitters. It was heavyweights and uh, featherweights. How many of those heavyweights have had success? Where is Juan Espino? That's my first question. (laughs) Juan, I'm calling you out, man. Come back and fight. I know he's doing, you know, some different stuff over in the Canary Islands, but bring it back, Juan. We need you. But you've got guys like Josh Appelt, uh, Jeff Hughes, Maurice Green, Ben Sassoli, there's all sorts of names that really haven't done anything in the UFC. And then if we flip the coin and look at the featherweights, who's kicking around from that season that wasn't a bantamweight that isn't doing anything in the women's uh, featherweight division? So if we look over at middleweight, are Adesanya and Costa the guys to revive it? Adesanya speaks incredibly well. Paolo Costa tweets incredibly well. So is that going to play in a season of The Ultimate Fighter? No. Paulo Costa is a Brazilian. He's going to speak Portuguese. He was on The Ultimate Fighter Brazil Season 3. How did that go for him? Not all that great. And then if we look at this, so you're going to lock a bunch of people up into a house. You're probably, you know, once they get acclimated, they're all together. They're inside of their own little bubble. So you don't totally have to worry about COVID. But in terms of these guys... Are they really going to sell a season of The Ultimate Fighter? And I heard it brought up on, um, I want to say it was either the Luke Thomas show or it was Mortal Kombat. It was one of those two shows that Luke Thomas is on where they kind of talked about it and the fact that, is this going to bring big numbers? And if it brings big numbers, is it ESPN Plus? Is it going to be big ESPN, ESPN 2? Where are they going to float this show? So, John, I've really brought up a whole lot of things to unpack with this situation. But overall, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think that many people are going to be invested that heavily in the Ultimate Fighter. And I know that's how I feel. And you know that's how I feel because I've said these things a lot. And I know you have had your own experiences with the Ultimate Fighter. They're totally different than mine. I just don't see this being a great idea. Well, we've never seen the Ultimate Fighter on ESPN. So that makes it interesting. Uh, they, they have a marketing machine that's very much different than Fox or, you know, FX or any of the other places, Spike. Uh, that makes it interesting. I, I do think one thing I would worry about is the, the diminishment of Israel Adesanya's star in terms of, you know, the coaches tend to do weird stuff on these shows. They play pranks on each other and they get into stuff. Now, 
do I trust Israel Adesanya to navigate those waters? I do. In the same way, I would trust Chael Sonnen or some of these other people. But listen, a guy like Michael Bisping, who was on with Mayhem Miller, you know, his his brand took a little bit of a hit being a coach there. That he, he may have had a more meteoric rise. People might have started liking him faster had he not coached opposite Mayhem Miller. So I don't know. There, there's the potential for this to be clunky uh, because, you know, Paulo Costa is no stranger to awkwardness. Israel Adesanya usually makes the right choice when it comes to looking cool and saying things cool and doing cool things. But I don't know. I, I don't know that, you know, like you said, with Adesanya, I'm sorry, with Costa not being completely fluent in English, is there an issue there where it's like he's saying some things that get misconstrued and they get tweeted? They're going to be able to edit this and make these guys look the way they want them to look. So from that perspective, I'm not too concerned about it. It could be a win-win. It could revive tough, and it could help to promote the fight, which is what the Ultimate Fighter was initially all about. And, so, and, and it could end up like Chael Sun and Vanderlei Silva, and you could have some weird moments where they're pushing and shoving. Like I, but I, I just don't see it. I mean, I'll move on from here. I just don't see it being. Craig, who knew Chael had commitment issues, right? He said, I can't let you get close. I can't <laughs> let you get close. And the COVID memes were born back then. All right, John. So we move on. And Kay Hansen, she scored a great finish in her win uh, last weekend. UFC debut over the former Invicta Adamweight champ, Jinyu Fry. And what a relief for the guy who put 37K on her to do so. Meeting her gambler post fight, that was weird, was it not? Yeah. And the guy's wearing like Fendi and Prada and he's got like Gucci bags. It was really weird. But that's not the question here because Kay Hansen had to respond to a horde of fans online upset about a top that she wore a few years ago when she was 18 years old with Invicta that said, I love the way Candace Owen think, Owens thinks. Hansen responded on Twitter saying, I was very young and in a manipulating and toxic environment during that time in my life. I was also very young. Uh, so she repeated herself with that one saying views and opinions evolve as well. Taking all of this into account before you jump on that hate train. So here's my question. She said she was heavily influenced by uh, family and those closest around her to portray a certain kind of image. So are people overreacting to this entire situation? And regardless of your answer to that one, will this become a talking point that she'll have to overcome for the rest of her career? Uh, I think there's a way to put it to bed. I don't think this was it. I think there's a way to move on past it, but um, it's, listen, I'm an old guy. And when you're an old guy and you think back to the difference between 18 and 20, you don't see a huge difference between it. You're a younger guy. I'm sure you would know more, you know, have more access to the difference between when you were 18 and when you were 20. So her saying that um, I was in a manipulating and toxic environment, her kind of throwing her family under the bus in a way, I'm not crazy about that. But it opens up a larger conversation for me, which is to say, are we going to be all about free speech or not? Because if just because this girl supported Candace Owens, we're willing to write her off. I mean, I know we're in cancel culture now and Candace Owens isn't popular and I'm not a fan of Candace Owens. But if I were, I wouldn't want this to be the thing that ultimately defined me. She's a fighter. That should be the focus of what she does. And uh, now, in the, now I will say this. She is a fighter, but when she chose to wear that to a weigh in that she brought it into her fighting world, right? When Kobe Covington got interviewed by Candace Owens, he brought it into the fighting world. So I think that there's steps that people take that ultimately lead to these problems. I think that if she's moved on past that, then go ha have an interview with Joe Rogan. I don't know if she could score one yet, but have an interview with somebody that says how you evolved. Just a simple, you know, statement. I don't think it's going to get it done. And this is just me talking as her PR person. It's not me. Um, saying that uh, I, I have feel a certain way about her. But if she wants to move past it, she needs to take a few more steps than just saying, oh, it was a bad time for me two years ago. You know? We had the that's, same president two years ago. Hasn't been that long. That's the difficult thing. Like, I know I'm 25. When I was 20, yeah, I was an idiot. I mean, I really was. You know, I wasn't focusing on my studies like I should have. I broke out of that mold, and now I'm here hosting a show with the great John Franklin on Canada Day. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first question I think is an easy one. Are people overreacting? Yeah, they are. It's social media, and that's the way that people react. And whether you view yourself on the left or the right of the political spectrum, you're always going to be wrong in the eyes of somebody on the internet. So that's the game that you're playing. And even though it was two years ago, people are still going to bring it up. So the second point Will this become a talking point that she'll have to overcome for the rest of her career? 
if she doesn't really nip it in the butt and if she isn't given, you know, a chance to tell her side of the story rather than, you know, respond to a tweet with a picture of it and saying, you know, I was manipulated. It was a difficult time in my life. And I know she kind of, she talked about it a little bit with MMA fighting, but not really, not in the form of like a long form interview. It was just responding to a couple of different questions. So yeah, if she's given a platform where she can at least kind of delve into it a little bit. And I don't expect, you know, uh, a young up and comer um, on the YouTube scene or the interview scene to ask her a tough question like that. They're probably going to say, hey, how was your last fight? What are you focusing on for your next fight? Is Straw the future? Will you ever move up? They're going to ask questions like that. They're not going to hit hard with something uh, that involves this. I would expect like Luke Thomas and Ariel Helwani, somebody to bring her on and probably broach the subject a little bit, you know, in, in greater detail. Um, so hopefully it's not something that follows her for the rest of her career. And she hasn't gone and this, you know, hear me out here. Colby Covington went full heel turn. But when Colby Covington did it, it was like, I'm the MAGA guy. Um, I I have the sport of the president. Like he, he played a character. So that's not really what she's doing. And it, it's going to be difficult for her to kind of break the mold. But I think if she's given the opportunity to at least explain her side, you can really put this one to rest. Well, and the last thing I'll say that I find interesting about this is that sometimes it's like when you stick to the gimmick or you stick to your side, people are less forgiving. It's like no one's calling to cancel Kobe Covington and he's dug in on it. She's at least saying, I regret it. And it's like, well, it was in your past. You made a mistake. Sorry it's a problem for us. It's like, no, no, no. I know I made the mistake. I'm telling you I was wrong and trying to change things. And people are more upset with her in a way than Kobe Covington, who's sticking to his guns. So I don't know. All right, Craig. Footage was released this week of Justin Gaethje and Kamara Usman in a spar. I don't know if people use that term, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start it. In a spar. The footage I will uh, note was very careful to show no advantage to either fighter because really who wants to start the Gaethje versus Usman stuff at this point? But it was our first glimpse at a few things. One, them sparring. But two, Gaethje getting up off the floor against a high-level wrestler, which has been rumored he's this great wrestler forever. We never get to see it. So, Craig, I ask you on the strength of this video, or by extension, the fact that these two are training together, am I safe to bet my children's college fund on Justin Gaethje beating Khabib Nurmagomedov? Hey, John, this whole spa spar debate goes back to Darren Till and Mike Perry. And hopefully we can talk about that fight coming up soon. Wow. Fireworks. <laughs> Buddies so at one cool. point going to the spar. Um, in terms of this one, Justin Gaethje has better shot at beating Habib than A, a lot of people are going to give him. And B, a lot of the people that Habib's faced in the past. And I think that Gaethje has a better shot than McGregor did, than Barboza did, Michael Johnson Dustin Poirier, anybody that Habib's fought, Glayson Tebow. Everybody talks about that Glayson Tebow fight, like it was some big deal, and that Tebow actually won it. I think Gaethje has a better shot than that at beating Habib. Um, but just by the strength of the video, is that really evidence that Gaethje's <laughs> going to beat Habib? No. I mean, remember the Polly Malinaji videos with Conor McGregor? Did they mean anything? They meant nothing. Floyd Mayweather decimated Conor McGregor. And it left a pile of rubble and not just the MMA media, but media at large that said that Conor McGregor was going to whoop Floyd Mayweather. Never forget. And I know exactly all of the people that said that McGregor was going to win that fight. I keep that in a Rolodex up my head. But what, again, should you bet your children's college fund that Gaethje's going to get the win? Are you the guy that wore Fendi and Gucci and bet all that money on Kay Hansen? No, don't bet that money. Don't bet that money. In fact, I not only didn't bet all that money on Kay Hansen, I only invested a dollar in her in our spying stock. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I've made less of a commitment than anybody. We, we both did. Uh, you know, I think this is important. Uh, I think the training together is important. I think the Gaethje facing high-level uh, wrestlers like Kamara Usman is important. If you were going to tell me that I had to bet on a Kamara Usman uh, – can be in a Magomedov wrestling match. I don't know what I would what I would say there. I do think that Justin Gaethje has the game plan. I do think Khabib has been exposed in the sense that people know that he's looking to get you to the cage. Once he gets you to the cage, it doesn't matter who you are, it's bad news. Can he get you to the cage if you know he's trying to get you there and you are a good wrestler on your own? Uh, that remains to be seen. But the, we know where he's going. 
that's that's the thing that he's kind of been exposed. Now, can Kamara Usman help Justin Gaethje with that? Absolutely. But that still doesn't mean that Gaethje can win. So I, I'm not prepared to bet my kids' college fund on it, but I think that I think these two guys training, uh, if we if we avoid the fact that they're only one division apart, and that they could and then sort of po- paint them as some super fight, I think fighting Gaethje helps Usman a lot against Gilbert Burns because of the leg kicks, because of some of the some some of the strikes, and I think Usman helps Gaethje a lot with the wrestling. So obviously this training camp's more geared towards Kamaru Usman, like you said, because I mean, he trains with Gilbert Burns all the time in Florida. So he has to switch camps. Burns gets to stay in South Florida. So this is my question for you. So Gaethje's going to be taking on Habib. We assume that that's a fight that's going to happen. Who's the best guy that Justin Gaethje could train with to try and replicate that Habib type of pressure in one of the lower weight classes? And and I would consider 72. So 70 down. Who's the best guy that he could train with? You're taking Usman out of the equation. Yeah. Wow, that's a good question. Man. He could pick he could pick any any guy to fight. From 70 to 25. 70, well, Cejudo, but I think Cejudo's too small. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would go with Cejudo, but I don't know that that would help him size-wise. Who else is a good – Is a, who do you got? I mean, there's a lot of fighters out there, but the one that jumps off the page, and you have to consider him, Gleason Tebow. <laughs> Gleason Tebow has to be the guy. I mean, i got to bring him back up. Um, most what? Most takedowns in the lightweight division of all time? Gleason Tebow, all kinds of top control time. He's one of those guys. It would have to be somebody that can chain wrestle. And the thing with Kamaru Usman, if you're strictly training with him the way that he fights, it's volume punches and he can chain takedowns, but he doesn't really do it to the same level that Habib does. He doesn't do it where he gets you down. He wraps your legs. He stays on top. He beats you. He kind of switches positions. Like he doesn't really wrestle like that. So it's kind of tough to find somebody that, that could replicate that type of pressure um that's one of the ones that we're just gonna have to leave up to the fans unless you can come up with a name i'd like to hear what uh, what everybody's thinking out there i mean who's a wrestler that could replicate that habib type of pressure from 70 down it's interesting because you know there's some there's some wrestlers right there's there's woodley there's uh but i mean you know my uh there's guys at 70 that i, that I just don't know that they're gonna do what, what habib does that's where i think the question gets really interesting right ferguson there's guys that I like, Kevin Lee. There's guys that I like as wrestlers. I just don't know. They, I, I, I wouldn't. You're not going to get any better than Kamaru Usman, and you got him. So I think that's the way to go. All right. Well, we'll continue on, John. And some people love this fight, and some people hate it. Me included. I hate it. I'm talking about Alexander Gustafsson taking on Fabrizio Verdum, which is set for later on this month. Now, Gustafsson said that the move up to heavyweight might not be permanent. Do you buy that, or is he set for a run at 265? I think that he knows that there's not much for him left at light heavyweight. He's lost to John Jones twice. John Jones doesn't seem like, despite all his posturing, that he's going away. So unless unless they – maybe he's leaving the door open if they give Dominic Reyes and Jan Blakovich a uh, interim fight. Maybe he comes back to 205. That makes some sense there. But – I don't know, man. I'm not crazy about him. He, I, I, listen, he's a tall kid, so obviously he can put some some weight on and still be sort of manageable. The video that we saw, which is kind of like when you catch celebrities on the beach, the video that we saw did not look favorable to him. It definitely, you know, wasn't complimentary. But some of these guys, I think they just make a decision about what weight class they're going to go to, and the fastest way to get there is to eat themselves there. You know, we look at Jean Vellante. He didn't look that great at, at when he moved up to heavyweight, and he was a, and he was, and he was beach ready at two hundred five and eighty five. So I think that Gustafson could do it, but the question would be how. And, and his frame doesn't. He has a frame much like John Jones that you could put muscle on if you wanted to, but does it change the type of fighter he is? That's and the does problem. It help him or hurt him? Look at Ovin St. Pru. Ovin St. Pru at two hundred five cut. I mean, huge legs, lots of power to throw those high kicks from either stance. He goes up to 265, and he still looks good, but, like, he looked hesitant. And I know you're fighting Ben Rothwell, 
herky jerky and he's going to come in there and pressure you and and jab your face off but Ovin St. Pru didn't look like Ovin St. Pru in that fight. Jean Vellante listen I, I'm not a I'm not a fan of like fighters. Let's just throw that out there. But I'm not a big fan. <laughs> You're doing the wrong podcast, my friend. Okay, hear me out. You know what I mean? It's not like I have a poster of Jean Volante on my bedroom wall or, or on my ceiling for that right. matter. You're not I'm a fan boy. No, that's the thing. Jean Volante 205 had the saltiest of records. And even with his win over Ed Herman, he didn't beat Ed Herman in that fight. Ed Herman won that one. Even it was a split. So a lot of the fights that he had at 205 were splits. He beat decent fighters. He lost to good fighters. Not a good run. So he moves up to 265, and he looked like a bag of milk. And again, to you Americans down there in Canada today, we have bag milk up here in certain parts. Ontario East, bag milk. Um, but if you're looking at Gustafson, yeah, I've seen the video. I've seen some pictures on Instagram. They're not overly flattering. Um, I would think that, you know, you're spending the summers in Sweden, you'd be, you know ready with your tank tops, your, your guns out and you're getting ready for an EDM fest. And I know that this summer is not the time, but still, I think a move up to 265 will ultimately benefit him. I think getting a win over a guy like Verdum, I don't know how much it means now just off of the loss to Alexei Olenek and how bad he looked. I think Gustafson runs over Verdum, but after that, it's a lot of really good fighters. I mean, who do you match Gustafson up with after that? Olenek? You go Curtis Blades, you go Nganu, do you go Rosenstrike, do you go Overeem? I think he loses all of those fights. Like, it's really difficult. You know, okay, I'm with you. I think that if I'm the UFC, this might be a gift because if you have a guy like Gustafson who's got a name, we don't know what to do with Curtis Blades. This is what to do with Curtis Blades. Here's a wrench in the plans, and I hate to say this. Do you get me Anthony Johnson? Do you run it back with Rumble? Is that what the people want at 265? Heavy? I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on with Rumble. I think Rumble, Rumble needs to hurry up and come day. back because he's, again, we talked about Curtis Blades being sort of in this position where who do you match him up with? He's beaten or is better than most of the guys below him. He has the losses to uh, Nganu that, you know, you can't you can't get, get around. So he's a tough guy to do something with. Gustafson definitely gives you an option there. So. All right, Craig, Dana White released some footage of Fight Island and all the preparations that are being made for it this week. And I got to be honest, at the end of it, I almost committed to a timeshare. I'm in. I like to take the kids there once or twice a year, maybe rent it out to some friends. That's the vibe this video gave me. Craig, here's my questions. You can answer them in any way you want or avoid them altogether like Dana would. But what I'm wondering is, what is the point of this video? Is it to show all the measures he's taking to ensure fighter safety? Because if so, why didn't he do one for the fights that took place at the Apex? Or is this just Dana taking a victory lap? Basically saying, I told you goofs I was going to do Fight Island, and I did it. Easy answer. Uh, and, and I'm going to answer it with a question. How much money is the UFC getting from the government of the United Arab Emirates to go to Abu Dhabi? A ton. Probably I getting imagine. a ton of money because from what I've heard, these fights that are going to take place on Yaz Island have nothing to do with what they're contractually obligated to do with the country. They're supposed to go over there, what, a, uh, once a year, I believe. Now they're going to be going five times just in the span of a few, well, five, six weeks, whatever it will be, to have these fights. So I think it's a promo for the country. I think it's Dana White saying, hey, thanks for letting us have these fights. Thanks for your money. We'll do you a solid. And hopefully John Franklin sends the kids and, and the wife and the family over there with the timeshare. I think that's all it is. It, it's got nothing to do with a victory lap. It has everything to do with financial incentive. Do you think that there will be any uh, gentlemen from the United Arab Emirates who are allowed to go see the fights? Yeah, I do. <laughs> do you think that they will be tested or do you think that they'll like, how do you think that's going to play out? I think you'd have to be tested. I mean, you can't, you can't have this. This is the weird thing. So with the NBA, everybody's in the bubble, everybody's in the hotels. And then it comes out after the fact that Adam Silver basically has kind of like a get out of jail free card and he can come in and out of a back entrance all the time and in the bubble, out of the bubble. So Adam Silver is kind of like that you know, special case. Will we have any of those with uh, Yaz Island? Maybe. You probably won't hear about them, but I think for the safety of everybody involved, you should get tested. I mean, at the very least. I'm interested 
and how much money these guys over in the, in the Sheiks and whatnot over in the UAE are going to be able to throw at Dana White to sit cage side. And if we're actually going to get some, some noise at these fights from, from like, let's say a thousand guys over there that all pay the money to, um, you know, it's funny because Bill Simmons was talking to Ryan Rosillo about them having like a millionaire's club in the bubble. And they get tested like everybody else, but they get to and then, you know because he said you know with these guys that got money, it's all a matter of like oh I was there, I was there, and they keep the public out generally. But these guys pay like you know, uh, I think he said like if, if you were rich, would you pay twenty million dollars to watch half the basketball games or or all of the playoffs or whatever you know or or the finals? Would you pay that kind of money for that if you're rich just to say you were there? Um, I think people would. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how. Um, but how that plays out. But that aside, it, in response to what you said, I agree. I do think it is kind of a um, – this is going to be a boost to the tourism of Yaz Island in that area. All right, John. Conor McGregor has remained largely quiet on his fighting future in recent weeks, although we have heard from his coach, John Cavanaugh. A couple of nuggets of Cavanaugh dropped on us are that – A, Conor McGregor and Justin Gaethje. The fight was very close to happening before the pandemic hit. He also said that he can't get Conor to do a thing by way of a comeback. So, John, it seems that at least in terms of his near future plans, Conor McGregor remains retired. So we'll ask the question we always ask, is this a shrewd marketing ploy by Conor, or is he just wasting time? Uh, I don't really think Conor's one to waste time, meaning he's always making money. But so he's always got plans. He's always got things going on. I will say this. He's wasting his prime. So if that's wasting time, then yeah. Like, I mean, all, these are the years that, I mean, if Connor is truly when trained and focused, the guy who fought Donald Cerrone, and that was a prime Donald, not prime, but like a, a, on a game and ready Donald Cerrone against a no, it wasn't. prime. Well, Okay, so let's say it wasn't a prime Donald Cerrone or, 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 a, or a, a game Donald Cerrone at his best. Connor still took him out in, in one round in, in less than, I think, two minutes. So my point is is that if that's what we can expect from him at against everybody not named Khabib or Gaethje or whomever, then, yeah, he's wasting his prime. He should be fighting uh, Dustin Poirier. He should be fighting Tony Ferguson. He should, be fight, should have fought Justin Gaethje. I think that he will realize – that this sort of sitting back and picking and choosing what works best for him doesn't always work best for the UFC, and things like the Gaethje fight are going to fall through. If he would have fought Gaethje and beat Gaethje, he'd be in a much better position right now, but, you know. I mean, the problem for me, it's easy to say that he's wasting time and this and that, but he's the type of fighter that needs to be on a card that has a big venue and a huge live gate met with the pay-per-view sales. Like, he's, he's the type of guy that gets more – than we're ever going to know, but he gets a bigger piece of the pie than most people would, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So if they had a card hypothetically at Yaz Island where United Arab Emirates are paying millions and millions of dollars and he can sneak in on a little bit of that and fight like a Ferguson or Gaethje or Poirier or whoever in the lightweight division, somebody with a big enough name or Jorge Masvidal and both of those guys win, um, then I think he would do it. But I think he's still retired. I really do. And I don't see him fighting before the end of 2020. Do you think that he's that he's going to be able to find the fights in 20? Is he this guy that's always going to be able to find the fights that he wants? And yeah, it's a matter like you said. I, I agree with you, and I hadn't thought about it that but, way. I agree with you that Connor exists best in a world where all factors are clicking, right? It doesn't help Connor to fight in empty arenas, is my point. The only other fight I could see him taking, and it's stupid to say, and I know it's the one that's thrown out there, what is it, 176 pounds with uh, Anderson Silva? I could see that happening before the end of the year. If Anderson Silva is fully healthy and if Conor McGregor wants to fight, I think that's the fight you can make. And I think it'd be entertaining. I honestly don't know who would win this far out, but that's the only thing I could see happening this year. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, Craig, let's move on to sparring sessions. Craig, Latoura Gonzalez is batting 1,000 as a corner person. Her and her charge, Mike Perry, got it done last weekend. So the question is, why do we need corners? And furthermore, has Mike Perry killed MMA cornering? 
Uh, no, he hasn't killed MMA cornering. Um, Latori, I've got this in front of me, and I'll probably never use it again because you're never going to need one of these. Uh, but I've got a Best Western Rewards card. She's going to need one of these, and she's going to want to start racking up the miles because, I mean, yeah, she's one of the winningest corners of all time. And congrats to her. I mean, you're doing it solo. Has he, has Mike Perry killed MMA cornering? The one thing about it, I've heard this argument made, is the fact that. I mean, let's pick Conor McGregor, for example. So he made $100 million to fight Floyd Mayweather. How much of that money did he have to pay out to his manager? I mean, he had his own promotion, but does that really mean a whole lot? He had to pay money to his camp, to his coaches, everybody involved. Who does Mike Perry have to pay? I mean, he probably trains at a gym. He doesn't train at home. Um, he used to train at Fusion XL. There's all sorts of places in Florida where he could train. But who does he have to pay for like, you know, you're allowed the three people in your corner. Well, he only had one. So who does he really have to pay? Does he have to pay his girlfriend? Probably not. They probably have an unspoken agreement if it's not been spoken. But with a guy that owes that much in taxes, it's, it was probably unspoken. Um, has he killed it? No. Everybody's, you know, things are going to go as usual. You might see this happen again with somebody else as a bit of a marketing thing. But uh, no, I don't think he's killed cornering whatsoever. I, I would be interested to see. I don't think anybody else will do girlfriend. I think that someone else might do just no corner at all. And I think that for me, what makes the what makes the Perry situation interesting is there's only a handful of guys, right? Maybe ten, maybe a, maybe a, maybe even a dozen of guys who are knowledgeable enough and narcissistic enough to not have a corner man, or guys who are just lack the self awareness to not have a corner man, or are quirky enough. Right, Diego Sanchez would do this. Obviously, he had you know anybody that anybody that had a questionable corner man would go with no corner man. Right, we can agree with that. But I think the people that are knowledgeable enough, like you know, does Cruz need a corner man? Maybe not. Does DC need a corner man? Maybe not. I mean, there's guys who coach. Uh, who's the kid that took the short notice fight? Kraus. He's a coach. You know, there's certain guys that have coached enough and are you know are are enough traveled that they may not need a corner man. I think it's – for me, I think it's a question you have to ask yourself as a fighter. What do you need in the corner? And if you're like Mike Perry, he has a very ad, – we talked about this before. He has a very adversarial relationship with coaches and cornering. And he thinks that the coaches are trying to steal some of his shine. He thinks that the coaches are trying to tell him stuff to make it, him do stuff that they want him to do to then take credit for the win. I could see that if you're Mike Perry. I could see why he thinks that. I don't agree with it, but I can see why he thinks that. So, yeah, I could see guys who are thinking, who start to do this numbers game of, like, how much money would I save by being a part of like, – like, if you trained at the lab here in, in Phoenix or uh, Fight Ready here in Phoenix or if you trained at, you know, wherever, and you just paid your, your dues and got your training in and then traveled on your own and didn't take the coaches with you, how much money would that save? That's the question. And only those fighters know that, and it would depend on, you know, maybe I could see maybe for Contender Series. Like, I remember, and it wasn't that long ago, it was, what, 2017, 2018, when Tim Johnson fought in Brazil against Marcelo Golm. And the big issue there was he couldn't, he like, he couldn't afford to bring everybody with him. And it was a big issue for him. And he was, he's, I'm assuming he's the type of guy that wanted to have his corners or needed some extra guidance or advice during a fight. And he saw the benefit to having multiple people in his corner and things worked out. I mean, he went, he won the fight, but ultimately, you know, it was something that was in the news at the time. Mike Perry to me is just, yeah, kind of a one-off. I don't think many people are going to follow his lead and just having one corner person. Namely, you know, a significant other. Unless, and again, it's a stretch, Amanda Nunes has just Nina Ansarov. But when Nina Ansarov's in her corner, she has a full, she has yeah. the four. So it's not just Nina. Well, and, and she also is, has someone who has a vast knowledge of the MMA world and uh, the MMA fight game. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I can see Perry's, Perry's point in that he has tax issues he has, I'm sure, a, a large budget of recreational drugs and bad tattoos and baby oil. Who knows what Mike Perry buys, but whatever it is, he buys it in surplus, I'm sure. So from that perspective, yeah, it probably would make some sense to everyone in a while to say, you know what, just stay home.
But I, he's a guy, Craig, I'm telling you, if he was just a part of a gym, would that be enough? I, I think maybe. Yeah, I, th- I think maybe too. All right, Craig, let's move on to rank them. We are going to rank Canadian fighters. It is Canada Day. We are going to rate Canadian fighters from, let's go from 10 uh, to 1. I will let you start. Let's keep it Let's keep it real clean. What I'm going to let you do is I'm going to let you, because you're the Canadian, it's Canada Day, you rank the fighters, and I will make any adjustments I need to make, or I will agree. So 10 to 1, start whenever you're ready. I would sooner go 1 to 10. That's fine. All right, good enough. Number one, easy, George St. Pierre. That has to be your number one. He went 20 and two um, with the UFC, insane record. GSP, double champ, one of the, well, probably the greatest fighter of all time. That's number one. Number two, it's a toss up, but I go Rory McDonald, number two, the Red King. The success that he's had, not just with the UFC, but with Bellator, and now all of a sudden the PFL, and he hasn't fought one single fight with the PFL, but they're going to come out with like a six part series on his life and his career. So he must have done something right at some point. Rory McDonald, number two. Number three, it's tough. I would say Carlos Newton's probably number three, former UFC uh, champion. Didn't have the greatest UFC record, but a champion nonetheless. That's number three. Number four, Julia Budd, longtime champ over with Bellator um, in the featherweight division. She's number four. Number five, TJ Grant from Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, it was a shame that, you know, injuries kind of robbed him of the prime of his career. He was one of the best lightweights, uh, at the time and then forced to retire early. So TJ Grant, um, number six, I'm going to say probably Gary Goodrich, just based on the amount of fights that he had. It's kind of a shame the way things have gone from, uh, in the last few years, um, obviously claiming CTE, but Gary Goodrich had a wild career and, uh, definitely a lot of fun going back to watch his fights um seven if i'm not mistaken i would go with probably uh mark hominick i guess i mean fought for a title uh ufc 129 definitely went poorly for him against Jose aldo and uh you know one of the worst hematomas you've ever seen so that's number seven number eight i'm gonna go with this is a really biased number eight, and people are going to hate me for it. But I'm going to go Ryan Jimmo uh, from New Brunswick, Canada. You know, St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. It's not that far away from where I'm from. Uh, at the time, the quickest knockout of all time against Anthony Proche, where he knocked him out, and then he did that weird robot thing, and he did the splits in the center of the octagon. That was pretty cool. Um, gone too soon, Ryan Jimmo. Uh, my next one from the Ultimate Fighter number three. Harold Clarence Howard, and we got a saying up here in Canada, especially in Niagara Falls, and he said that if you're coming on, come on. Harold Clarence Howard uh, got finished in the uh, finale there. And if you'll remember, Hoist Gracie gave up in the semifinal fight against Harold Clarence Howard, threw in the towel right at the start of it. And then number 10, this is such a BS pick for me, but uh, a guy who fought for Canada at UFC 200 against... Uh, the one and only Mark Hunt, and beat the brakes off him, only to have that overturned to a no contest because he was full of horse tranquilizers and steroids. Brock Lesnar is my number 10. Not because of his credentials, only because of his his Canadian status? Yeah, I mean, you could throw, like, Christoph Stroyzinski in there at number 10 if you wanted. Uh, Felicia Spencer fought for UFC title. Valerie Letourneau fought for UFC title. There's a lot of fighters there. You could throw Alexis the Alligator Davis in there if you wanted. There, there are you know there have been a lot of good Canadian fighters over the years, but uh, I'm going to throw Brock Lesnar in there on a technicality. All right, so I have I have a few issues with your list, so uh, I'm going to move a few fighters up, a few fighters out. Oh, um, here here's where I'm coming at this from. I think that obviously GSP is number one. We get to number two, uh, and, and I don't want to. I don't want to gloss over GSP. So let's let's talk about him real quick because he deserves it. You touched on some of it. GSP was uh, a self-made man in the sense that he came into martial arts uh, as I believe in like karate, taekwondo, and turned himself into one of the best wrestling MMA fighters of all time. To the point where some of the compliments thrown his way were he could have made the Canadian team. 
uh, for wrestling. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but it's still it's still impressive to be an Olympian in any sport that you did not set out to do originally. Uh, great striking. GSP, you never knew kind of how he was going to take you down later in his career after he'd been knocked out. Obviously, he was more of a takedown kind of guy, but he had the strikes. He had all. He had the full complement. Uh, most successful Superman puncher of all time, George St. Pierre. Number two, I'm going to go Carlos Newton instead of Roy McDonald. And I do agree with that McDonald has had a, a, a pretty significant career. But Carlos Newton beat Pat Militich, however controversial, and held a UFC belt, something Roy McDonald never did. So I'm going to – Kate, Kate. This is why I didn't have him at number two. Okay. He went three and four in the UFC, and his overall record was 16 and 14. I'm with you. I'm That's with salty. You. That's salty. Yeah, and he, and he didn't do a hell of a lot better in pride. I mean, he's, he's someone who is more um, known for his losses than his wins, but he's got that UFC belt on his mantle, so I'll go with him. Number three, I'll go with Carlos Newton. I agree with Julia Budd. TJ Grant is one of these guys that we just never know. Like he was seemingly the presumptive 155 pound champion. There was times when we thought this was going to be the guy and then he just disappeared. So I agree with he you. Had concussion issues, John, of course he, he disappeared. We'll get like, to that in uh, hitting the speed bag. Ricardo Almeida, he lost to him in 2010. Then he beat Shane Roller, Carlo Prater, Evan Dunham, Matt Wyman, and Gray Maynard. Not Gray Maynard out in the first round. He was scheduled to fight Benson Henderson. Uh, and then he had a severe concussion, and that was the end of his career. So here's where we're going we're gonna, to, uh, I think, really begin to, to have some issues with each other. On your list, you made room for Harold Howard. You made, no room, Howard. You made room for Brock Lesnar. You yeah. made no room for the crow, David Loazzo. David Loazzo fought for a 185-pound belt. He was a good friend and training partner of uh, George St. Pierre. I I'm going to put David Loazzo at six. I'm going to put him above Gary Goodrich. Then I'll give you Goodrich. Actually, I'm going to switch Goodrich and Hominick. Um, I like Hominick a little bit better, although Goodrich obviously had the more – Story career has been around, fought pride. Fought, he's fought everywhere, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, Hominick, Goodrich. I agree with you about Ryan Jimmo. I'll throw uh, Harold Howard in there just for fun. And then um, the last one I'm stuck between Felicia Spencer, Sarah Kaufman, and Hakeem Duwadu. Okay. Valerie Letourneau fought for the title in the UFC. She fought for a title with Bellator. She has good wins, but like never won the belt. Felicia Spencer fought Chris Cyborg to a decision and lost. She fought Nunez and got the tire beaten out of her. I mean, Sarah Kaufman's been there and done that, but didn't win the PFL last year. Invicta champ. I'll give it to Kaufman because she's got a belt. Here's the one person that we're not talking about that I thought when I was younger, when I was your age, this is the guy that everybody talked about. When is this guy going to go to the UFC? Chris Hordecki. Nope. And if you look at his records, you're like, man, was he that good? Everybody thought he was great, but he never made it to the UFC uh, in a big way. I think he did fight in the UFC. Uh, Dennis Kang. De everybody talked about Dennis Kang. He was like pre-Eddie Alvarez, the underground king. And then he just never made it happen. So that's my list. I'll put. Okay, I'll put. Quick, Alexa, quick, quick pause Sarah there because I, I had to pull it up. Dennis Kang didn't they pay him a lot of money to come over to the UFC and then it didn't work out? Like yeah. kind of like a Hector Lombard type situation. And then yeah. the other thing about Dennis Kang, interesting fun fact about Dennis Kang. I know you know British Columbia claims him. He's from St. Pierre in Miquelon, which is an overseas French territory just off of Newfoundland and Labrador, just off of Newfoundland, really. And it's like a stone's throw away from the island, but it's France. So if you're, you know, a world traveler and you want to go to France, just go over to Newfoundland, take a little boat and go over to St. Pierre in Miquelon, and you can say that you've been to France. All right, let's move on to hitting the speed bag. I got some questions for you this week. They are in uh, celebration of Canada Day. In a weird way, now here's what I want you to understand. I have asked you questions 
that are yes or no questions, but I am mandating that you explain your answers. You could very easily answer these questions with yes or no, but I, and you're going to notice the theme uh -oh. very early on. First question. Maple syrup. Was GSP ducking Johnny Hendricks and Anderson Silva when he retired? Uh, yes, he was because of the way that he got beat by Johnny Hendricks. And yeah, he got beat by Johnny Hendricks. So let's not dance around that one. And yeah, he definitely ducked Anderson Silva like the entirety of his career or the entirety that those conversations were happening. And then even when he was going to fight Bisping, did he say he was going to fight Anderson Silva? When it came up? No. So, yeah, he danced around them. He didn't want any part of that smoke. Number two is Roy McDonald a bust by the metric of what he should have been. What should he have been? A uh, champion in the UFC. According to all, I mean, he was the he was the phenom. He was the next coming of George St. Pierre. He was the next coming of uh, Vitor Belfort in terms of an 18-year-old who everybody thought yeah. was – I mean, I could flip this one around. I know it's hitting the speed bag. It's supposed to be quick, but what about Jordan Meehan? I mean, Jordan Meehan fought Rory McDonald. They both fought when they were super young. Jordan Meehan was supposed to be a huge prospect, and now we're talking about Bellator's own Jordan Meehan. So was he a bust? Yeah, I guess. I mean, you're really hitting me right to the heart right now, but Karen, I guess we're by... We're being fair and balanced on Canada today. By some people's standards, he was a bust. I, I'm... I I love these questions. Did David Loazzo really deserve his title shot against Rich Franklin? Probably not. Let's just take the uh, the wind out of the Canadian sails. <laughs> what is this, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Next, did Carlos Newton getting slam KO by Matt Hughes take away from the Pat Militich victory? Well, yeah, it did. I don't want to be here right now. Next. How many of the elbows that Gary Goodrich threw against Paul Herrera were excessive? They were all in good fun. None of them. All right, two more. Next. TJ Grant could have kept fighting, right? Oh, my gosh. Severe concussions. <laughs> all right, last question. Uh, explain Nickelback. Listen, John... I never made it as a wise man. I couldn't cut it as a poor man stealing. Tired of living like a blind man. Sick inside without a sense of feeling. And this is how you remind me. This is how I remind you of Canada. No, it's poor showing on my part. But I had to, I had to have some fun with the speed bag today. And I did. So, uh, listen, I apologize. I'm wearing a Canada shirt. Canadians, please forgive me. I just... You're know. forgiven. All's I forgiven. Thought, I thought that was funny. <laughs> All right, let's move on to start the conversation. Craig, let's give our shouts to MMA Reddit. We'll start the conversation. Dana White says that he was prepping the 135-pound division for Amanda Nunes and trying to build it for her, and now she's talking about retirement. Now, that's an old story, but may bring up a new conversation. So if Dana's efforts at 135 are all for naught, which honestly – isn't it better that he built a division up if she leaves than if she stays? That's neither here nor there. Let's put that aside for the moment. What is the division that if Dana was going to put time and resources into now is in the most trouble? What division most needs a shot of adrenaline? Lightweight is the best division in MMA, period. Uh, whether it's Bellator, UFC, LFA, that's stacked concrete whatever you want to say that one's good featherweight's great lots of uh lots of interesting prospects lots of guys in the top five that could fight on any given day for the title and possibly beat uh volkanovsky bantamweight doesn't have a champ flyweight doesn't have a champ so that's interesting but bantamweight right now couldn't be in a better spot flyweights had a little bit of a, uh, an injection of talent i mean guys like david dvorak um who else brandon royville getting the big win over tim uh elliott so that's not that bad. So we've gone all the way up to 55. Welterweight, I'm looking at the top 15. Anthony Pettis, 15. Robbie Lawler, 13. Uh, Nate Diaz is ranked. Dos Anjos, Damian Maya, Tyron Woodley. 
You see where I'm going with this one? I mean, 205, at least we have some prospects coming up that you can get excited about. Even guys that are unranked um, that still have yet to crack the top 15. And then at, at heavyweight, you guys get guys like the Bozers that had the big win over the weekend. Maurice Green that maybe could crack it. Cyril Gone and the like. For me, it's a division that traditionally a lot of people think of it as heavy. But Walter Waite. Walter Waite's the one that it should be one of your best divisions. Your champion's great. You've got Masvidal, you've got Burns, you've got Covington, and so on and so forth. But again, Maya, Dos Anjos, Nate Diaz, Robbie Lawler, Anthony Pettis. There's five names in your top 15. How long are they going to be around for in that top yeah. 15? I don't think they're going to be around for all that much longer. At middleweight, you've got Brad Tavares, Omari Akhmedov, Derek Brunson, Yoel Romero. How long are they going to be around in that top 15? I don't know, but I think the shelf life on Akhmedov and uh, Brunson are better than the, the Lawlers and Dos Anjos of the world. So for me, Walter Waite. Walter Waite, traditionally a strong division. Outside of the company, it is. I did a whole video on Walter Waites that the UFC could sign or could compete uh, with the promotion, like the Roberto Soldiches or Drikas Duplessy decided he didn't want to be a middleweight and thought that Walter Waite was the key. But I mean, I don't know, you know, KSW. <laughs> With my physique, I don't think I do all that well. But if I pump myself full of, again, the horse juices, maybe I could. I think Walter Waite's the one you go with. What are you thinking? Uh, I'm thinking I want to do a, a quick experiment with you. All right. And, and this is not me shirking the question. I mean, I came up with the question. So You're going to pump me full of steroids? No. <laughs> yeah. I wish you would. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to give you a division. You give me the title fight and then what fight you go with if that fight falls through. All right. And you can even do the ones that are already booked. All right. Heavyweight. Who's fighting for the belt? Uh, Cormier Miocic three is the one that everybody wants. One guy pulls out. Who's fighting for the belt? Francis Ngannou. Okay. So that's not bad, right? We can promote those fights. Okay. Ngannou falls out. Then who do we got? Uh, Curtis Blades. Okay. So we're doing heavyweight's good. We got three guys that can fight for the belt, three guys that we can promote. Cormier's leaving, but we're still good. Light heavyweight, who fights for the belt? John Jones and Tiago Santos, if he's healthy. Okay, he falls out. Santos. Dominic Reyes, easy. He falls out. Jan Blahovic. So are you feeling good about those three, though? Because Yeah, they, all of those guys deserve it. Santos had the split decision. Dominic Reyes had the fight that was so close. It wasn't a split, but a lot of people thought that he won it. And then Jan Blahovic just keeps beating people, so he definitely deserves a shot. So now as we're going along between these two divisions, uh, which division do you think has the more promotable fights? Heavyweight, right? Heavyweight, yeah, yeah. Okay, even though the lightweight's got Jones. Uh, all right, middleweight, who's fighting for the belt? Adesanya and Costa. Costa falls out. Probably Whitaker. Whitaker falls out. Gets tough. Uh, Yoel Romero again. Yeah, so that's we're, we're, it's a lot more difficult to... Or Darren Till, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Walter Wade, who fights for the belt? Uh, Burns Usman already booked. Burns falls out. Covington rematch. Covington falls out. Masvidal. All right, so that's not bad. We got we got some we got the the next fight they're booking is the least promotable of the three. So I like I'm with you in the depth, but I do like what they can what they can do what they can promote. Uh, 55. Who's fighting for the belt? Habib and Gaethje. Gaethje falls out. Conor McGregor? McGregor falls out. Dustin Poirier. So we're good there. All right. Uh, featherweight. This featherweight's tough. Featherweight's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Volkanovski Holloway's already booked. Holloway falls out. I don't know. Uh, I, I have no idea. This is the problem. Josh Emmett's rank. Well, it says on the UFC's rankings, I brought this up on Instagram Live tonight, Frank Yeager seven, Josh Emmett's also seven. So I'm assuming that Josh Emmett's below Frank Yeager, he's eight. Josh Emmett, if he's healthy, does he get a title shot? Like Brian Ortega doesn't deserve one. Does a Korean zombie? And Zabit Magomed Shripov's number two. He doesn't deserve a title shot. You know, it's interesting. This 45 of all divisions is the hipster's division. In terms of you love everybody on that uh, on that roster, couldn't see but maybe two guys with a belt over their shoulder. So that's yeah. where it gets really interesting. All right, Bantamweight. Uh, is Cejudo my champ or is it vacant? Vacant. 
No, yeah, Sue, because Sue is retired. Let's take him out of the equation. You rematch Aljamain Sterling and Corey Sandhagen. I didn't see enough. Okay, so <laughs> no, I'm gonna uh, say I'm gonna say Sterling's the favorite. Let's, let's go. Okay, let, let's, let's go. Hold on, no, no, we gotta fight this. We got Jan, Jan and, and Aldo. Okay, so, so Aldo, Aldo falls out. Aldo falls out. You do Marais. Marais falls out. Sterling. Okay, so that's even that. I mean, it's not something you could promote necessarily. I don't even know if it's. It definitely wouldn't main event a pay per view. And it's I would say Sterling, event. Sterling first over Marais, and then if Sterling falls out, then you go with Marais. Okay, so then we got uh, twenty five. Davidson Figueredo to... and Benavides are rematching, right? Yep. So we'll say I, 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 Benavides this is, is easy. A, okay, so Benavides falls out. The assassin baby is going to be champ by the end of 2020. So it's Brandon Moreno easy. Okay. And then after that, Pantoja has got a fight book, but Pantoja, like it's one, a one B between Moreno and Pantoja. All right. So, so we're seeing, so based on just my quick recollection of this, we're having trouble promoting 205, right? No, no. 40, 45 is the toughest. 45 is the toughest one to promote is the one that most needs an, an injection of stars. Yeah, 45 right? and 85. Now, and in, so in fairness to Dana White, when you're wondering, see, that's where it gets weird. I think maybe they should have looked into a Volkanovsky. Well, Volkanovsky fought Aldo. So, all right. Now let's hit the women real quick just so they don't get left out. 45, uh, Nunes is still active. What fight do you make there? You don't. It's got to be her and Megan Anderson. Come on. I guess. So her and Megan Anderson, Anderson falls out, then you got what? Can rematch take... Spencer, rematch Durandamy, rematch Holm. Okay, so that needs some help. And it's 35. the same thing. It's the same thing at 35. Durandamy, Holm are one and two, and they're gonna fight each other for title shot. Right. Or, or and then I don't know. I mean, really, Arena Aldana deserves a shot. Juliana Pena somehow ranked really high. Aspen Lads up there. You have options. You have more options at 35, but then again, your champ retired not retired sitting on the sidelines so this is why we went on this journey i just hired you for the ufc you're the president of talent acquisition all right wonderful you're the vice president of talent of actual acquisition that's how they always do it right you're always the vice yeah. president of basketball operations and the owner's the president um so you're the vice president of talent acquisition i just gave you five million dollars who are where are you most infusing it if you have to get a name Probably 85. I mean, you got out of Sonya. Whitaker, is Whitaker a bankable star? I don't know at this point. I know, I don't know if they consider him a bankable star. I know tough with Gaslam. He's, you know, a champ that's been a champ. But is Whitaker all that marketable? Paulo Costa, super marketable. But does he sell? I honestly don't know. I mean, he has great fights. The fight against Roel Romero was great, whose name apparently I couldn't pronounce. He looks like a Greek god, and his Twitter game's funny. But does he sell? Jared Cannonier, awesome fighter. To go from 265 to have success at 85 like he has, amazing. Who's spending their hard-earned money to go see Jared Cannonier fight? I don't I know. know. I'm going to give you a crazy analogy or a crazy fighter comparison. Uh, and this is, this is very much clippable. Robert Whitaker is the Bill Murray of MMA, and here's why. Bill Murray, if you hear, if you read about him or hear the stories, he's like this guy that just kind of like lives his life and then just kind of shows up and makes a movie and then goes back to living his life. No one knows where the hell he is. No one knows what the hell he's doing. I think for Robert Whitaker, and listen, Whitaker's got some family stuff. He's got some injuries. He has his reasons. I get it. He lives in Australia or New Zealand or wherever he lives. He lives on the other side of the world. Australia. Yeah. My point is, is that that's what makes him so difficult to market is the guy just goes on these long stretches where he disappears. And I think that if that's the way that you're going to conduct your fighting career, I mean, he lives basically in the same place that Israel Adesanya does and Israel Adesanya is the biggest star in the world. So my point is, is that if Israel Adesanya can live on that side of the world and be marketable, so could Robert Whitaker, but he keeps taking these long stretches away. He, he's not as good at keeping himself relevant. Yeah, but the trouble with Bill Murray is that he sells every time. You could put him in a gorilla suit and somebody would watch that movie. Fair enough. 
All right, guys, there you have it. The episode of this episode of Early Stoppage on Fight Night Picks is in the books. Be sure and comment under the video. Let us know what you'd like to see next from the show here on YouTube, but also on iTunes and Spotify. Craig can be followed at Craig Allen FMP. I can be followed at SM Cornerman. The fight has been stopped. We'll see you next week. Happy Canada. Is it happy or merry? It's happy. Happy. Happy, happy Canada Day. Craig, say something witty. Joyeux fête de Canada. That's the wittiest thing you've said yet. Merci. <laughs>